So today, we're just going to keep driving down on airside HVAC systems. So last time we talked about different system types and configurations. Today, we're going to focus on a very specific type of airside system called air source heat pumps. So this is somewhat of a special type of system, which is why it gets its own, its own dedicated lecture. If you think back to what I called our typical heating sources in HVAC, most commonly we have natural gas, electric resistance, or hot water coils. And now we're gonna add one, which this is not a new one. We've mentioned it a few times, but this is a heat pump. And a heat pump uses a refrigeration cycle to heat a space. Okay, that was odd. Can you hear me still? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what just happened. My screen freaked out on me. Okay. <laughs> full of uh, technical hiccups tonight. So a heat pump, think of a, a DX, direct expansion refrigeration process, which would be any typical air conditioning unit. When a space wants cooling, we're gonna pull heat from the space, dump it outside. Heat pumps are doing the exact same cycle, but in reverse, meaning when a space wants heat, then the heat pumps will take energy from the outside and then dump it inside. So we're reversing the process. If you think back to lecture two, I had a very basic diagram here where if we're gonna pull 3000 watts of heat from the outside, we have to run our heat pump. So say a thousand watts of power. If you have a thousand watts and 3000 watts going in, you're gonna get 4,000 watts of useful heat out. But let's start looking at that in a little more depth. If you have a heat pump system, heat pumps can work both ways and provide heating or cooling using the same equipment and the same components. But that is an or statement there. So it can't do both at the same time. It can either be in heating mode or cooling mode. This term heat pump is a, kind of a misnomer. It's not really a correct term because even a basic air conditioner is still a heat pump in the sense that we're moving heat from one place to another. But when we're talking about heat pumps in the HVAC industry, heat pump specifically means a DX cooling system that is also capable of heating by running that cycle in reverse. So if somebody tells me, oh, this building has heat pumps, I take that to mean it can provide heating and cooling. So before we get into heat pumps, we first need to dive into a better understanding of how a basic DX cooling system works before we talk about how it's different. So this setup, this is a basic heat pump air handler, and this would be in cooling mode, which means we are in the summer. So we're trying to maintain the space at around 70 degrees. It's nice 95 degree hot day in the summer, which means we are mixing that air to about 82 going into the unit. And then we have our DX refrigeration coil. And that's gonna be piped between this indoor coil and this outdoor unit, which is, <clears throat> you could call the condensing unit. 
um, which this also has a coil in it as well, and you're blowing outside air through it. So these two coils are connected with refrigerant piping that allows that refrigerant to basically go in a loop between those two pieces of equipment. Our DX coil inside the unit, that's what's absorbing heat from the airstream. So the refrigerant at this point is at a cold temperature. So when this warm air hits it, it cools it down. The condensing unit outside, which is going to be on the roof or the ground, that's going to dump heat to the outdoor environment. And so at that point, a refrigerant is at a hot temperature in order to reject that heat. And then we ultimately take that 82 degree air, cool it down to 55 degrees, send that out, out into the space. And that's our basic air conditioner. Now, any of you who have taken thermodynamics, probably more thermo two, I know a couple of you are engineering management majors, so I'm not sure if uh, those individuals have seen this before, but this is a pressure enthalpy diagram for a refrigerant. So there's a lot going on here. You don't need to know everything on this chart, but the idea is as you move up this chart, that's an increase in temperature and pressure. But you got this funny little hump here. If you're to the left of the hump, your refrigerant is a liquid. If you're on the right side, your refrigerant is a gas. And if you're inside this hump, it's going to be somewhere in between. So I, I'm, I'm hoping some of this is review, but maybe it's never been discussed specifically in regard to a DX cooling process. But this red line here is showing the refrigerant process and what the refrigerant is doing at each stage. So on this bottom line here, that's our cold refrigerant. That's the lowest part on this process. So that's where our refrigerant is at its coldest. So that means that is at our indoor coil cooling down our airstream. And then this increase in temperature and pressure, that is our compressor that that's the device that literally compresses the refrigerant and turns it into a high temperature, high pressure refrigerant. This compressor, this is the big power draw. So when we're talking about energy use of an air conditioner, the compressor is the thing that makes this all happen and that's the thing that uses power and energy. This top line, this is where our refrigerant is really hot. And so that is where we are able to dump heat to the outside. We're making our refrigerant so hot that we're still able to dump that heat to an already hot outside air condition. And then the last part of this process is the thermal expansion valve, which takes our refrigerant from the high temperature, high pressure point drops it down back to the low temperature, low pressure point, And then we just start this process all over again. And this thermal expansion valve is, it's a passive device. There's no power to it. This compressor, that's where all the power goes. So looking a little closer at these components. So we have our cold refrigerant and the evaporator coil. It's not always going to be 40 degrees, but we'll use that as an example here. So if our refrigerant is 40 degrees in here and you hit that with warm air, that will cool down the air and you'll get colder air on the other side. And so that's the bottom part of this chart. So our refrigerant is absorbing heat through this process. It's pulling heat energy out of the airstream. And when you're when you're within the middle of this hump, this is a, a constant temperature line because it's going through a phase change. So that's why you don't see it go up at all. It's riding that constant temperature line, but it's still pulling energy out of the air. And then you have your compressor, which typically sits in that outdoor unit. And so 
if we're following our refrigerant down the pipe here, it's going to hit that compressor. And then that's where it compresses the refrigerant, makes it high temperature, high pressure. And then it goes through a coil that's in here. And now our refrigerant is nice and hot, say 130 degrees. And so even though we are hitting this with 100 degree outside air, it's still going to reject that heat because we're at 130 in the refrigerant. And so now the refrigerant is going to cool down on this process because it's rejecting heat. The air coming in, say at 100 degrees, and it's gonna leave warmer. If, if you see one of these and it's running in the summer, you put your hand over this fan, that air coming out of that thing is really warm. I mean, not enough to burn you or anything, but it's, it's going to be considerably warmer than whatever the outside air temperature is. So now that our refrigerant has rejected a bunch of heat, it's gonna go down this dashed line and it's still, it's still hot. Again, this is a constant temperature change right here, but we are losing energy. So it's running down here, still nice and hot. And then we hit this thermal expansion valve, which is the last part of our process that drops the refrigerant temperature and pressure down before it hits the coil again, where now it's cold again, and you just keep going through this process. There's an analogy that's often used. It's called the, the, uh, the DX cycle baseball diamond. I'm not much of a baseball fan, but it's, it's a good analogy. So there are four major components to this process. So we have our compressor. This is where the magic happens. So that is our home plate. We have our condenser coil, which is going to be outside. That's what's rejecting the heat to the outside. Our thermal expansion valve to drop it down. And then our evaporator coil, which will be inside the building that cools the airstream. And that compressor, that's where all of our electrical input is going. The outdoor unit still needs power to run the fan that's in there, but the compressor is where the bulk of the power is gonna go. So following that process, our compressor makes our refrigerant high temp, high pressure. It hits the condenser coil, still high temp, still high pressure. And then we hit that TXV and now our refrigerant is at a low temperature, low pressure. We cool down our airstream, still at low temperature, low pressure, and now you're back at the compressor. This is commonly split into two sides. So we have the high side of this process on the right side because that's where our refrigerant is, is hot and it's at a high pressure. And then we have the low side of the process. And basically every refrigerant based air conditioner works like this in some fashion. So now you have a better idea of what that looks like in a basic air conditioner, but how would this look in heating mode? So now we're gonna look at the same system, but we're, we're flipping the script. We still have our refrigerant piping connecting our two components. Again, these are using all the same components as our air conditioner. We have our DX coil inside the unit, but note now we are at a hot temperature right here. And at our outdoor unit, we're going to be at a cold temperature. And so those have actually flipped and I'll show you why here in a minute. So if our refrigerant is hot in the coil and we're gonna hit that with say 60 degree air because it's winter. And so our air is going to be a little cold. Maybe we can heat that up to 90 degrees, send that into the room to heat our space. And we're gonna kind of, we're going to look at the same steps. Um, it'll be a little abbreviated, but you'll, you'll see how it differs from the cooling mode. So again, same components here, but now we are actually reversing the flow direction. 
So now we have hot refrigerant in our coil, say 110 degrees, which means our refrigerant is rejecting heat into the air. So if we're coming in at 55, leaving at 90, so that would be this condenser coil side of the equation before it was on the bottom. But now the indoor coil is on the top of this process loop. We have our TXV. So once the refrigerant has rejected heat into the airstream, now we're gonna go down this dashed line. It'll hit that thermal expansion valve, make its way to the coil in here. It'll hit the evaporator coil. So because this hit the TXV, now it's cold. So we have cold refrigerant going through here. And now if our refrigerant is at say 10 degrees Fahrenheit, well now we can actually absorb heat from the outside air. So even though our outside air conditions are 30 degrees, which is pretty cold, because our refrigerant is colder than that, the refrigerant will still absorb heat from the outside. And then our outside air through this coil will leave a little bit colder because we've taken heat out of it. After it's hit that coil, then it hits the compressor and makes it nice and hot again. We send it back to the indoor coil and we just keep running through that. So looking closer at this pressure enthalpy diagram, it's the same exact process. So we have cold refrigerant, except now we're pulling heat from the outside when we're in heating mode. We still have our compressor work. We have our hot refrigerant side, but now that's on the inside coil, dumping heat into the building, and we still have our thermal expansion valve. And then back to the baseball diamond, all the same components, but now we're going in reverse. So in heating mode, we're running the bases backwards and we've flipped which side of this is the high side and which side is the low side of this pressure enthalpy process. So now the high side where our refrigerant is nice and hot, that's on the inside of the building because that's where we want the heat. But you might notice that in heating mode, our condenser and evaporator coils have essentially flipped. So whereas before this was our condenser coil, now this is our evaporator coil and then vice versa over here. When you're doing your homework, you might need to run through those previous slides. You know, look at the slides side by side in heating and cooling mode and see how they're different. It's the same process, but we're just changing up where we're pulling and dumping heat. That's it. Our heat pump efficiency, we covered this a long time ago, um, but as a reminder, coefficient of performance. That is the typical expression of how we talk about heat pump efficiency. So if our COP is three, that means we can deliver three BTUs of heat energy for every one BTU of input. And as another reminder, DX cooling efficiency is typically expressed as EER and not COP. You can convert between the two. In fact, I think it's often a good idea to convert things to COP because COP is very easy to work with because it's dimensionless. But the industry norms, again, the industry does things a certain way and I couldn't tell you why because it was all decided in secret meetings long before I was born, I'm sure. In the industry, we use EER when we're talking about DX cooling and COP when we're talking about DX heating. And our DX equipment will have different efficiency values for heating and cooling, even though 
the heating and cooling is being provided by the same equipment. They're all the same components, same parts and pieces, but that does not mean they'll have the same efficiency in heating mode and cooling mode. And you also have to remember that your efficiency is going to change with outside air temperature. I've mentioned this many times, electricity, way more expensive than gas, but because heat pumps can have way better COPs compared to natural gas, it can still be a smart move. So if your electricity is three times as expensive, but your COP is 3.0 or maybe even 4.0, 5.0, as compared to natural gas, which is right in that 80 to 90% efficiency range, well, at that point, it becomes a bit of an economic game, figuring out, well, when does it make sense to use heat pumps over gas? Also depends on the utility rates. If you live somewhere with super cheap electricity, then that would probably make more sense to use a heat pump as opposed to somewhere with really expensive utility rates. And bottom line, if natural gas isn't available in the more rural areas, uh, a lot of times natural gas is not even an option. You can't just get a Vista to provide you natural gas. In those scenarios, heat pumps are often a, a great option. They're an especially great option if you're in moderate heating conditions. If it's 30 to 50 degrees outside, you still need to heat your buildings, but that's not an extreme winter condition. So if you're in that moderate 30 to 50 degree Fahrenheit range, it's a lot easier to pull heat from the outside when it's a little bit warmer. Conversely, when it's zero degrees outside or minus 10 or minus 20 degrees outside, the heat pump has to work a lot harder to extract that heat. It's a lot easier to pull heat when the air is warmer. And all of this is, is driven by delta T. I mean, virtually all heat transfer concepts are rooted in delta T relationships. But if your climate, wherever you're looking to install these, if you have a lot of hours when it's really cold outside, maybe heat pumps aren't the best idea. With heat pumps, there's this idea of what's called a balance point. Our heat pump COP and the associated capacity, meaning how much heat, how much BTUs per hour can our heat pump output? That's going to vary a lot based on what the current outside air temperature is. I mean, we just talked about this, but to reiterate the point, if it gets colder outside, it becomes more difficult to pull heat energy out of that air. And so in those moderate conditions, say 45 degrees outside air temperature, you might get a pretty good 3.0 COP. Well, that's great. But maybe your COP at colder air conditions drops. So maybe you only get 1.5 COP when it's 20 degrees outside. And to add to this, as our outside air temperature decreases, as it gets colder outside, the heating load in the space increases. So as it gets colder outside, we need more heat to keep that space comfortable. So our heating load goes up and our heat pump output goes down, which is the exact opposite of what we actually want. Wouldn't it be great if as it got colder, our heat pumps got more effective at creating heat. Well, they, they don't create heat, but you get the idea. So there's this inverse relationship between what's going on with the outside air temperature and the heating load in the space and how much heat output we can get from our heat pumps. So most of the time, 
these systems have to have some kind of backup heating source. If it gets too cold and the heat pump just cannot meet that load, you very likely will need this backup heating source. Most often, this will be electric resistance heat. I don't really like that option because now you're back to square one and spending a lot of money on your heat. But you can have also backup hot water coils or natural gas or really any of the other potential heating sources. But most commonly, it's just straight electric resistance heat. And so our heat pumps, they typically have some kind of balance point, which is the outside air temperature where the heating capacity of our heat pump equals the heating load of the space. And I'll have a graphic here in a moment to help illustrate this. And note that this is different than a balance point when we were talking about heating and cooling degree days. That was a different kind of balance point. So if we're above this outside air temperature, whatever this balance point is, the heat pump can handle the heating load on its own. So our heat pump max output is greater than our heating load, meaning we're good. The heat pump has capacity to work with. But once we get below that outside air temperature, we need some level of backup heat to keep the space comfortable. And so at this point, our max heat pump output is less than our heating load. And so the space will get cooler and cooler if we don't have uh, another way to heat that space. To put this graphically, so I'm showing BTU per hour on the y-axis, outside air temperature on the x-axis. This is what our heat pump capacity looks like. So when our outside air temperature is nice and warm, we can get a lot of heat capacity out of that heat pump because it's easy to get heat when it's warmer out. But our space heating load, if we have a high outside air temperature, we don't need a lot of heat in our building. But as it gets colder, our heating load goes up and up and we need more heat. And so where those two lines intersect, that's the balance point. That's the point at which our heat pump output exactly meets the heating load and we don't need any backup heat. But then once we go below that outside air temperature, now we need to turn on that backup heat to make up the difference. And that's where the heat pump is going to be least efficient because if it has to run a bunch of electric resistance heat, well, now you're defeating the whole purpose of your efficient heat pump system. If you're in a more moderate climate, maybe you don't need backup heat at all. That's awesome. That's where you want to use heat pumps. Seattle, great example. They're peak winter design temperature is about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And heat pumps generally still run pretty well down to 20 degrees. As a point of comparison in Spokane, we usually design to uh, around zero degrees Fahrenheit or five degrees. <laughs> and at that condition, heat pumps start to not operate nearly as well. You might be able to operate your heat pumps and their backup heaters at the same time, meaning you run the heat pump to get what you can out of it. It's not enough to serve the entire load, but maybe if you can serve half of the load with the heat pump, then you only need to turn on the backup heat to 50%. You're just making up the difference that takes a little bit more control sophistication. Your thermostat or your building automation system has to know how to do that and how to stage those two heating sources on and off. It's more common to just say, hey, below some outside air temperature, just turn on the backup heat 
and let it rock. Turn off the heat pump completely and just let the backup heat do everything. That's not as efficient of a way to operate, but in terms of the simplicity of control, that's super simple. You just need to wire a little outside air temperature sensor to the outside. And if that sensor sees that it's below, say, 15 degrees, then it will just lock out the heat pump and only run the backup heat. Some heat pump terms. I've already talked about these a little bit. But the condenser, that's essentially where is the heat being dumped to? Where are we ultimately rejecting heat energy? So if our system is operating in cooling mode, the outdoor unit is our condenser because we're taking heat from the inside of the building, rejecting it outside. And then in heating mode, the indoor coil is the condenser because we're rejecting heat into the airstream. The other major term is the evaporator, which is where's the heat being pulled from. In cooling mode, that would be the indoor coil because we're pulling heat out of the indoor airstream. And then in heating mode, that would be the outdoor unit because we are pulling heat from the outside conditions. And these terms come from what's going on with the refrigerant, how it's changing phases. So the condenser, well, that's where the refrigerant gas condenses as the heat is rejected from the refrigerant. The evaporator evaporates the refrigerant liquid as heat is absorbed. So that's where those two terms come from. And you can try to think of it in terms of temperature and energy if you're having trouble remembering which is which is which. So if your refrigerant's absorbing heat, the temperature increases and is evaporated. So that would be the evaporator coil. If we are getting rid of heat, that will decrease our refrigerant temperature and it will condense. And so that would be the condenser coil. And so in a heat pump, which is which depends on the mode we are in. If it's a cooling only DX unit, the condenser and the evaporator are always the same components. It's only in a heat pump where they can swap. Next term is what's called the approach. In order to make any heat transfer happen, or at least most heat transfer, we have to have a delta T. All of this is driven by a delta T between the refrigerant and the surrounding air. Our refrigerant cycles between our low temperature at our evaporator and a high temperature at our condenser. As a quick example, let's say we're running in DX cooling mode. So we're trying to cool down an airstream and the refrigerant in that coil is at a super cold, well, pretty cold, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we're trying to cool down that airstream, the absolute coldest that that air could leave the coil would be at 40 degrees. Because the air can't get lower than the temperature of the coil it's hitting. So if that air is hitting a 40 degree coil, it couldn't ever cool down below 40 degrees. It's just, it's not going to happen. But going down to 40 degrees, that's not going to happen either. In practice, the air is going to leave at some temperature above the refrigerant temperature, usually around 55 degrees. That's kind of a magic number in HVAC as far as how cold you want to deliver air into a room. So the approach defines how close we can get that air to our refrigerant temperature. So if we have a low approach, that means we are getting very close to those optimal heat transfer conditions. In that previous example, 
if we are really close to getting to 40 degrees, that would indicate a low approach. And conversely, a high approach indicates we're further away. We're not even getting close to those optimal conditions. Down the road, when we talk about chillers, we'll come back to this idea of approach. But let's try to visualize it. So we have a basic cooling system here. We have entering air conditions, 82 degrees, leaving at 55. The refrigerant in here is at 40 degrees. So because our refrigerant's colder, our air will be cooled down. In this case, our approach is 55 minus 40 or 15 degrees. Our leaving supply air got within 15 degrees of our refrigerant temperature. So that is our approach. And if you were to try to graph this, this is what's going on as our airstream is passing through this DX coil. So our air is coming in 82 degrees. Our refrigerant is at a cold 40 degree temperature. And then our air is leaving at a colder temperature. And then this delta here, that's our approach. So the red line could never cross the blue line. It's, it's impossible. It would break the laws of thermodynamics. But how close you can get, that is your approach. On the outdoor coil, so if our outside air that we're running through this is hot summer day, 100 degrees, leaving at 110, and our refrigerant is at 130, so now we're rejecting heat, our approach in this case would be 130 minus 110. Because our leaving air, the warmest this air could ever get would be 130 degrees, but it doesn't get there. So they got within 20 degrees of that refrigerant. And so this is what that would look like. So we have our entering air. This is the outdoor air that we're pushing through that coil, hitting it at 100 degrees. Our refrigerant, nice and hot, 130. And then we are rejecting that heat, or excuse me, um, the, uh, the air is leaving at a warmer temperature because the refrigerant is rejecting heat. And however close we get, that's our approach. Heating side, similar story, except now we've flipped things around. Air is coming in cold, leaving hot. The refrigerant, nice and hot in here, 110 degrees. Our approach in this case, our air got to 90 degrees, ideally could have gotten to 110. So that's your 20 degree delta T. And now this chart should look familiar. So we have our entering air coming in cold, our hot refrigerant temperature inside this coil, and then our air leaves warmer than it came in. And then the delta is the approach. On the outside side of things, our entering outside air, 30 degrees, leaving at 20. Refrigerants, nice and cold at 10. Well, our outside air got to 20, could have gotten to 10, but didn't quite get there. So our approach is 10 degrees there. And then this is what that would look like. Our outside air coming in, contact with a cold refrigerant, leaves a little bit colder and there's your Delta. The, the COP of a heat pump is driven by this equation, which is the what they call the machine efficiency multiplied by 460 plus the condenser temperature divided by the difference between the condenser temperature and the evaporator temperature. 
that machine efficiency value, that depends on the manufacturer. There's really no way to just look that up. So on the homework, I just give that to you, but it's typically in that range of 0.4 to 0.6, which this really just accounts for inefficiencies in the way that they build their equipment. And it's, it's going to be a manufacturer specific value. The condenser and evaporator temperatures, that refers to the refrigerant temperatures at those sections on the pressure enthalpy chart. So that is the refrigerant temperatures. That is not the sink or source airstream temperatures. That's an important distinction there. And the efficiency of our heat pump is gonna vary depending on the specific operating conditions of that moment. So at this moment, what is my high side refrigerant temperature? And what's my low side refrigerant temperature? And you can play around with this equation to see how raising or lowering those temperatures has an effect on our heat pump efficiency. To show this a different way, again, using this chart. So here's our basic refrigerant process. The distance here between the high side and the low side, that's the work that the heat pump is doing. That's the compressor part of this whole process. That's the part that takes the large majority of the power to make this thing work. So if we raise the evaporator temperature, if we can raise this temperature up, or if we can lower our condenser temperature, that reduces the distance or the work that that compressor needs to do. So if you think about an air conditioner, if it is not as warm outside, if it's only 85 degrees outside instead of 100 degrees, that may allow you to lower your condenser temperature and get the same amount of useful output out of your air conditioner. That's why uh, air conditioners are more efficient in those milder conditions. Is It's because you're starting to play with the high and low side temperatures on this process. And if you do the inverse, if you raise the condenser temperature, say on a really hot day, because if it's really hot outside, then you have to make your refrigerant hotter to still reject that heat. Or if you have to lower your evaporator temperature, now you're making your work harder. You're increasing the distance here. So back to this equation, if you play around with these temperatures, if you raise the condenser temperature, if you lower the evaporator condenser or evaporator temperature, then you can see what that does to your COP. All right, so today, this has all been focused on what are called air source heat pumps, commonly abbreviated ASHP, which all that means is that heat, the heat energy that we're moving whether it's moving it to the outside or from the outside, it's all coming or going from the, out, the outside air conditions. That's all the air source part of this means. We're either dumping heat to the outside air or we're pulling heat from the outside air. So that's, that's the main key. The outside air, that is our heat sink or our heat source depending on which mode the system's running. Another kind of heat pump is what's called a water source heat pump. You can probably guess what that means from the name. All that means is the heat energy is either being dumped or pulled from a water loop that's going throughout the building. Has all the same components, the compressor, 
thermal expansion valve, evaporator, condenser, all that stuff is the same. It's just your heat sink and your heat source is going to be different. It's going to be pulling or dumping heat into a water stream. And those are, are a bit of a different animal. And I'll have a whole lecture covering those specifically. That's all I got for you. We got about 20 minutes. Any, any questions, homework or otherwise? All right. Well, I'm happy to stick around till 6.05, but otherwise enjoy your, um, your long weekend and I will see you Tuesday. Hey, Professor, I just had a quick question about using refrigerant versus using water like you just mentioned. Okay. I'm just curious, what's the main difference in like, if you were to, for example, in a commercial setting over the summer, I was working on a project that used water source heat pumps. Um, now I'm just curious from your point of view, what, what's the difference or advantage of using water versus a refrigerant? The water source heat pumps are still using refrigerant. Oh, they are, okay. Right, the only real difference we hang on so if we're if we're in heating mode so this outdoor unit we're using the refrigerant to pull heat energy out of this air which is why it gets colder as it goes through this the only difference is in a water source system imagine a, a stream of water right here that has a coil in it. Got it. And Got so it. now you, you're still using refrigerant. You still have all this, all these components. You're just changing, uh, instead of pulling heat out of air, I'm pulling heat out of water. The main advantages of a water source system, uh, which, which I'll cover more in depth, but a quick preview is, a, a water source system, th there's one big water loop that runs through the entire building and all of the heat pumps in that building are on that same loop. So what that means is if some of your heat pumps are in heating mode and some of them are in cooling mode, now those heat pumps can just share energy Gotcha. Yep. Because you, you okay. have some some putting heat in and some taking heat out. And, uh, you know, most of the time there will be an imbalance there and you'll still have to make up some some delta. Um, but if you imagine all of those heat pumps, if they're in that magic operating range where it's in perfect balance, that's an extremely efficient system. Um, and they, they tend to be more efficient just from a raw uh, COP. But okay. we'll, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get more into that. The, the downside is they're a lot more expensive to install. Okay, got it. Is that just because the piping is more expensive or? Yeah. I guess, I guess we'll probably cover this later, but. Well, we, we don't really get too much into cost um, too, too often here, but the short answer is yes, all of that water piping you have to run through your entire building is very expensive. Um, in comparison, I mean, in this air source system, we still have refrigerant piping we have to run, but it's really small, super small pipe, as opposed to, uh, well, as an example, these pipes might be um, like three eighths of an inch on one and three quarter of an inch on the other. So really small pipe. Whereas the the water-based system, you're installing like two inch steel pipe yeah. everywhere. And yeah. it, it just, it adds up really quick. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep.
right, take care.